Welcome to the Golden Triangle University Project. Uh, my name is John Decker, Vice President of Exploration for SK Mining Corp and a research professor at Colorado School of Mines. Today I'm going to talk to you about the SK Mining Corp's uh, consolidated SK project, uh, which is in the heart of the Golden Triangle. And I'm going to be focusing on volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits or VMS deposits on our property. So here is a, a slide showing the location of our um, property here in northwestern British Columbia. And you can see to the right over here is uh, a slide showing our property boundaries as well as some of the um, properties nearby and other deposits that have uh, been discussed within this uh, lecture series. Um, you know, over to the east side, on the right side of this image, we have um, a lot of the porphyry deposits. That would be Treaty Creek, Iron Cap, Mitchell, Sulphuret, Kerr. Uh, and then we have, um, on our property, for the most part, our volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. And we also have, down towards the, the southern end of our property, where you see Big Red, Ted, and TMG, those are actually um, likely porphyry prospects, but we're going to be focusing on the VMS volcanogenic mass and sulfide deposits. And that's because of SK Creek, which is uh, controlled by Skeena Resources. That's up at the top part of this map. That was historically the highest grade gold mine in the entire world. Uh, so it you know, drove a lot of the exploration in this area when that uh, was discovered in 1988. But it's worth noting that uh, work in this area began around the turn of the 20th century, and it takes a long time to find some of these um, deposits. It's an iterative approach. It takes a lot of people, a lot of time to actually bring these things to fruition. Um, so we're going to be focusing on the VMS on our property here, uh, notably uh, the TB and Jeff deposits, as well as Sib and Lulu, and a host of other th um, the showings or prospects that we've found over the past uh, few years. But before I begin talking about our property, I do want to go through a little bit of the background of volcanogenic mass and sulfide deposits as understanding something about how these deposits form, the types of uh, volcanic and tectonic environments that they occur in can help guide exploration. So volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits are submarine in origin, that is they form underwater and back arc extensional basins. Uh, these are rift basins in a volcanic environment where you actually have extension of the crust dropping the um, surface of the land down until the point you get to be below sea level. And, and typically these things are forming at water depths of um, 500 meters or deeper, a lot of times it's going to be around 2,000 meters depth. Um, and you have a, a system, a convection system, where you have along the axis of this extensional rift, magmatic intrusion um, coming up right in the middle of this rift, and that's providing a heat source that drives the convection cells um, that generate the mineralization, where we have this cold seawater uh, penetrating along these extensional faults, these normal faults along the rift, uh, the seawater penetrates into this subsea floor environment and becomes heated. And in the process, it's actually starting to leach metals out of the surrounding host rocks. And then as this uh, fluid ascends or descends down to the um, uh, igneous uh, intrusion, it becomes quite hot and starts to ascend up the um, core of this uh, rift along additional extensional structures. And it's really where uh, these fluids are ascending is where we're getting uh, the, the VMS deposit. Um, most of you may be familiar with black and white smokers on the seafloor where we have hydrothermal venting um, in the submarine environment. That is the sort of thing that we're talking about here with a VMS deposits where you have this hot, water uh, that's metal charged ascending towards the sea uh, floor and right at the sea floor you have a very strong temperature gradient where these 
Now, hot fluids can be as hot as 350 degrees Celsius, but the seawater is at 2 degrees Celsius, so you have a very sharp uh, temperature gradient, and it's actually that um, temperature gradient which causes metals to precipitate out of solution and form a massive sulfide mound, as well as a, an area within about 100 to 200 meters of the seafloor uh, where you get uh, sub-seafloor uh, mineralization, uh, whether that's uh, sulfide veins and approaching uh, the uh, seafloor environment, you get sub-seafloor replacement where you actually have these metals um, and these fluids corroding the, the host rocks and uh, replacing these rocks with uh, sulfide minerals. So talk a little bit about um, some examples of these deposits. I, I should note these are probably one of the most well understood uh, ore forming systems there is. That's because we can see these things forming actively today on the seafloor. Uh, for instance, uh, the Wanda Fuca hydrothermal uh, field, which is uh, just off the coast of um, Washington State and Oregon, uh, we have th these extensional uh, rift environment um, where you have this kind of trend along strike of these rifts, uh, of these kind of uh, hydrothermal vents, and then uh, they're really focused where you have these kind of offsets, these transform fault offsets on these uh, rift zones really facilitates hydrothermal fluid flow because the more fractured and broken up the rock is, the more permeable it is to fluid flow, and uh, these fluids are able to ascend to the seafloor and form uh, these uh, sorts of hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. We also see um, these things in old rocks. The Abitibi district, uh, which uh, spans uh, the border of uh, Ontario and Quebec, is one of uh, the largest uh, BMS districts in the world. And what we see here are rocks that are about 2.7 billion years old, but they're exhibiting this exact same sorts of features that we see in modern VMS environments today, as well as uh, other VMS deposits uh, going back um, through that span of history from 2.7 billion years ago to today. And uh, we have up in the upper uh, right part of this um, slide, the Noranda um, camp right here. This is one of the largest gold rich VMS uh, districts in the world. And one of the things that's most important about these, in addition to having clusters of hydrothermal systems lying along strike from each other over several kilometers, these systems uh, can occur at multiple stratigraphic levels. And that's because uh, you basically have a situation on the seafloor where we're in an extremely seismically active environment. There's a lot of volcanism, and it's actually that um, same heat source that's driving these VMS systems is providing the magma that erupts and creates uh, the, the volcanic rocks that are going to be a major part of the talk today. And you need this period of volcanic quiescence. These hydrothermal fluids are traveling up the same structures that the magma is traveling up. So if there's active volcanism, it basically clogs up these uh, synvolcanic feeder structures and prevents the hydrothermal system from forming. But volcanic eruptions usually aren't persistent. They will subside over time. And it's during these volcanically quiescent periods where there's still a uh, magmatic intrusion driving um, or supplying heat to the system it's these volcanically quiescent periods that allow for hydrothermal systems to get established. And it's estimated that these hydrothermal systems can form a VMS deposit in as short as 100,000 years, which geologically speaking is a blink of an eye. And then at uh, a later time, uh, volcanism resumes, it buries the deposit and uh, the rinse and repeat. The, the same thing happens again and again until uh, the um, magmatic intrusion crystallizes, cools off, and then the, the whole um, hydrothermal system collapses and no longer exists. But what happens is you get this situation where these VMS um, deposits are continually buried by volcanic rocks, and that is, in essence, raising up the seafloor position 
you have another hydrothermal system, another VMS deposit gets buried again by more volcanic rocks, and then ultimately when the volcanism subsides, you're left with this background sedimentation, and you usually have a lot of um, thick sedimentary packages like the Bowser Lake Group, which I'll talk about uh, later, overlined these uh, VMS um, systems. So again, important to note that these deposits occur and clusters along strike as well as at several stratigraphic levels and that's important for um, exploration considerations. And then one more thing I want to talk about uh, with respect to the geometry of these VMS deposits is the near seafloor environment uh, where we have, if you imagine, this very seismically active rip basin, there's going to be a lot of debris down there. As these earthquakes happen and all this volcanic rock kind of slumps and landslides down to the bottom of this rift basin, you're basically just forming a huge pile of angular volcanoclastic debris that in essence acts as a filter for these hydrothermal fluids. Instead of the hydrothermal fluid just exhaling and jetting into the, the seawater and essentially just disseminating all these sulfides into the seawater, not forming a deposit, these volcanic plastic piles enable is for those fluids to take a more circuitous route to the seafloor and actually kind of diffuses the um, fluid flow and acts as a heat sink and these uh, massive world-class um, VMS deposits to form is this sub seafloor replacement type mineralization. So um, if you, you may hear people talk about VMS as exhalative and you want to find that exhalative environment. That's not technically correct. What you want is for these fluids to be um, dumping into a debris pile so you can actually form these uh, larger uh, VMS systems. And again, down here um, on the lower right is an example uh, from the Naranda district where there are several sub C4 replacement horizons. And again, you kind of bury these things under successive andesite flows and the uh, system gets reestablished and continues to form uh, more VMS deposits. So these things are usually stacked systems. And one last, um, Thing. Uh, this is a geochemical point, but this is very important because this is how we vector towards uh, these deposits is hydrothermal alteration. That's not something that uh, most undergraduate geologists learn about in school. You're mostly focusing on unaltered rock, but that's pretty boring. The cool stuff is when you're getting into hydrothermal alteration where these fluids are out of equilibrium, it's an extreme disequilibrium with the rock that it's flowing through. And um, a lot of times, especially if the fluids are hot, real hot, uh, they will start to uh, strip out uh, mobile elements out of these rocks and change the chemistry of the host rock. And these alteration zones are typically much larger than the actual um, massive sulfide deposit that we're looking for. So being able to find hydrothermal alteration on the surface, um, you know, today is a great way for um, us to vector towards these smaller mineralized zones. Um, so we have something we call the alteration index, which is really looking at how these fluids are uh, removing sodium from rocks and potentially adding potassium uh, to the rock. And that's kind of on this, uh, what we call the alteration box plot, this graph that's on the upper right, that's um, represented by the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have what we call the uh, carbonate chloride pyrite index, or the CCPI. And this is really looking at uh, the um, addition of uh, magnesium and iron to the system here. And this is looking at a different type of alteration where we're dealing more with chlorite, pyrite, various types of carbonates, whether it's uh, calcite, dolomite, or onkarite, as well as epidote. So, you know, these minerals that we're um, looking at on this plot are things that you can identify a lot of times through a hand lens, using a scratcher, using your acid, you know, your geology 101 mineralogy skills really come in handy 
when you're in the field. If you can understand what the minerals you're looking at are telling you about the hydrothermal environment uh, that you're in, you can really vector towards these deposits just using your brain and a hand lens, scratcher and acid. Like it's, it's pretty fundamental geology um, and it, it's exciting. We can actually apply that in the field. So, as I mentioned, uh, these VMS deposits occur in districts, uh, and we have a plot right here that's showing deposit tonnage on the x-axis and gold grade in grams per ton on the y-axis. And uh, most of these uh, VMS deposits on this plot are part of the Abitibi district, and we're kind of breaking these things down into uh, different um, sorts of uh, metal imbalance. VMS deposits typically uh, have a lot of lead, zinc, and copper. And I'll, I'll get into the uh, details of this in a, a little while, but it's really temperature dependent with hotter uh, fluids typically pre precipitating more copper and cooler fluids uh, progressively uh, precipitating zinc and then the coolest ones, lead. And then we have these gold rich uh, deposits and it's really not understood at this point geochemically why some deposits are gold and silver rich and others are not. That's a big outstanding question um, with VMS deposits. And if somebody could answer that question, um, there's probably uh, quite a bit of uh, money to be made in exploration just by understanding the genesis of these gold rich deposits. Again, we understand the architecture and the basics of how VMS form, but the actual uh, precious metal endowment is an outstanding question. Uh, but I do want to note SDA Creek on this um, slide. That is the one that's kind of all the way in the middle at the very top of this um, figure here. We're, we're dealing with something that produced over 100 tons of gold from one mine. And these aren't big porphyry deposits with gigantic open pits. This was an underground mine that produced um, nearly 100 tons of gold. So again, one of the highest uh, great gold mines ever uh, here at SK Creek. But despite years, almost a century of exploration in this region, there has not been another economic VMS deposit found. That's unusual because um, as we see, in the Abitibi, in the Ural Mining District, in Russia, uh, that these VMS, as I explained, occur in districts. So you're not going to find just one VMS deposit by itself. There will be others surrounding. Usually what happens is you have like horn deposit on here. You'll have one kind of mothership, huge deposit surrounded by several uh, smaller satellite deposits that can also be um, of economic grades. Since we're dealing with seafloor horizons and stack systems, we're going to need to know a lot about stratigraphy because of the location of VMS deposits is highly controlled by stratigraphy. So it's important to understand not only uh, sedimentary rock stratigraphy, but volcanic rock stratigraphy as well. We're dealing with the subsea floor environment. You need to be able to position yourself within that environment to locate the seafloor positions to be able to identify where you think these VMS deposits are going to form. Um, one thing I really want to hit on again is that this is an iterative process. It takes a lot of people, a lot of years to get to the point where we understand the geology in an area as rugged as the Golden Triangle. This is a very large area. Um, it's incredibly rugged, and um, as some of the, the presentations uh, on this lecture series um, by uh, Barry Holmes um, noted, it's helicopter supported. And the work of Jeff Kaibo is showing that you really have to take these regional approaches to try to narrow down where you want to look because we're dealing with such a large area. So we have a lot of previous work on the area and it is iterative and you're always going to be refining your understanding as you go on and building your work off of the work of others that came before you. So we're looking at um, the stratigraphic package uh, of the Hazelton group, a package of volcanic rocks that um, is 
broadly divided into a lower hazelton group, which is dominated by uh, this Inuk River andesite unit, as well as punctuated by a couple of uh, dacitic uh, units, the uh, Bruce uh, Jack Lake Felsic unit and the Johnny Mountain Day site. Uh, and, you know, our interpretation is that uh, this um, Betty Creek formation is really representing a volcanic arc at this point. We're talking about arc related and acidic rocks. Uh, the, the porphyry deposits uh, that are the east of our property, KSM, Treaty Creek, are uh, related to this um, stratovolcano island arc environment. Um, however, when we get onto our property, what we see based on our um, understanding the stratigraphy is we're dealing with submarine volcanism and we actually have um, a lot of evidence on SK's property of extension. You're starting to actually take this volcanic arc and rift it apart and you're extending this thing. So it's really starting to be the the end of arc volcanism and the beginning of back arc basin extension. And we have a transition from more of a porphyry type environment to where we're getting BMS uh, mineralization on our property. And I'm gonna show you examples of BMS deposits um, uh, forming within this Unit River andesite unit. Uh, then moving above that, we have the Spatsizi formation, uh, which really is only uh, occurring in one area along the SK anticline on uh, the consolidated SK property. And this is a, a largely sedimentary unit, um, mostly uh, the, the bottom parts a lot of carbonaceous, gray wacky and mudstone and very carbonaceous sandstone. And then the upper part uh, is a much cleaner, less carbonaceous and more calcareous um, sandstone at the top. And then starting to get at the very uppermost part of this fat CZ formation, uh, some actual uh, rhyolite uh, flows in the upper part of this uh, formation. And then we move up into uh, the um, more of the volcanic dominated package uh, of the Iskit River formation. This is dominated on our property uh, by basalt and day site. And the lower part of this package, uh, which has uh, been called the Bruce Glacier Felsic unit. And then uh, going up stratigraphy, we get into a, a zone where it's our uh, rhyolite and basalt. And this is what we call a bimodal volcanic suite. And this is a hallmark around the world of a, a full-blown, mature, extensional environment. So you're actually seeing through the stratigraphy going from you know this volcanic arc environment to this incipient rifting of the volcanic arc to you know the this basin just ripping open and filling with sedimentary rocks of the Spatsizi formation. And then we resume this um, bimodal volcanism of the mature um, rift basin and then overlying that is the Bowser Lake group, which is a, a non-mineralized package of submarine sedimentary rocks. And that represents uh, the period of time after uh, rifting where we don't have these active hydrothermal systems anymore. There's no more volcanism. It's just background sedimentation um, through the water column in a, a deep marine environment. So you know, kind of have to think about what we're looking at, the rocks we see in the field from this framework. You need to understand what the stratigraphy is actually telling you about the tectonic and volcanic environment in order to uh, effectively uh, locate uh, the best areas to find these uh, BMS deposits. So going to SK Creek here, this world-class uh, BMS deposit is located within the upper Hazleton group I just want to um, hit on this very briefly, but you know, as this uh, image on the right hand part of the slide shows, you have these kind of pink blobs right here located uh, along this yellow colored horizon right here. That uh, yellow horizon is what we call the contact mudstone. Some mudstones located within packages of volcanic rock and submarine environments are quite important because that's actually telling you where the seafloor was during a period of volcanic quiescence. You know, because you have these underlying volcanic rocks like uh, this uh, 
kind of a salmon colored uh, unit here. That's the SK rhyolite. And then you have the overlying basalts represented in green, but it's this thin mudstone layer that's representing our seafloor position. And sure enough, that's where the SK Creek a deposit is located, is right at that contact mudstone. And for the longest time, that's kind of where things remain. Let's just find the contact mudstone, ignore everything else. We just need to find the contact mudstone. But that doesn't take into consideration the fact that these things occur as stacked systems everywhere else in the world. So, you know, that's one of the things that um, our group started to do is look at a lot of these other prospects that people have worked on over the years, but uh, really weren't um, interpreted in the context of being BMS. You know, because people would be like, well, this is Betty Creek Formation and a site. This can't be BMS. It need, must be some other type of deposit, some vein hosted deposit, for instance. But, you know, when you start thinking about the broader context of um, how BMS form, you can get a better understanding of you know all of these other prospects on the property, and that's something uh, Skinner Resources has actually um, been working on as well. And they've been able to show that in addition to the contact mudstone, they have a lower mudstone and an even lower mudstone zone, and those are all representing paleo seafloor positions, and they're all mineralized. So. You know, it's really been within the last five or six years that um, exploration in this area for BMS has really started to grasp just how widespread uh, BMS mineralization can be in these environments. So talk about the work that we've done on our property. Um, you know, it's a very large property. We're talking about 526 square kilometers of extremely rugged terrain. Uh, the only road access is the SK Mine Road, and then from there, that's all uh, done by helicopter. So one of the first things that we did was a, a, a bleg or bulge leak, leach extractable gold survey. It's a stream sampling technique where uh, we uh, use a, a topographic map to define where drainage catchments are on the property, and we want to isolate our samples basically that we're taking from the stream to individual drainage catchments. And then we um, refine in the field, we refine these uh, stream samples by basically letting these samples settle through a column of water and then we decant water out of five gallon buckets. So we're extracting just the clay fraction of the sample. And it's this clay fraction that's quite important uh, because you're getting gold and other pathfinder elements adsorbed onto the charged surface of these clay particles. This is where mineralogy knowledge is vital. And we're removing the nugget effect because we're not dealing with heavy mineral separates. We're dealing with a clay fraction that has individual atoms of gold adsorbed onto the uh, surface of the clay. So we're removing a nugget effect and we're able to identify um, drainage basins that have anomalous gold and silver. And sure enough, we've identified several anomalies across the property, um, notably the Sib area, which is located just to the south of Escape Creek. And then we have uh, this area up here in the north uh, eastern part of our property, uh, noted by all these uh, red um, uh, polygons up here by Scarlet Ridge, Scarlet Valley, and Scarlet Knob. Um, so that's kind of in the Bruce Glacier and Jack Glacier area, very uh, strong anomalies. And then we go down um, towards the southern part of our property where there's uh, some of these red and pink polygons by Excelsior, as well as a very uh, large anomaly in the area that uh, is denoted by the C10 and Vermilion prospects down there. We also did a property-wide uh, electromagnetic geophysical survey where we were uh, mapping the conductivity of rocks, which is really showing us where these graphitic um, mudstones, particularly where uh, your carbonaceous mudstone has been faulted and deformed, you get development of graphite, and that's a, a strong conductor. And we also have magnetic data as well that's helping us uh, define some of the uh, geological formations because 
Again, a lot of this area is quite heavily treed, boggy. Uh, we do have stuff above tree line, but in order to really get a property-wide sense of things, it's helpful to have uh, this geophysical data. Uh, we've also done a considerable amount of uh, field mapping uh, because, you know, a lot of these uh, older maps are large scale maps. You know, it, it takes a lot of money to get out here and look at uh, this stuff in detail. And, you know, a lot of the government surveys can't just fly around in a helicopter everywhere and map in the detail they want to map at. So we come back and focus on these areas that the Blake survey identified and we do more detailed uh, field mapping. We use um, iPads uh, that we're able to connect to a, um, a uh, Garmin Glow uh, GPS receiver. So we have a good, within about three to four meter accuracy uh, data points when we're out there mapping and collecting our rock samples. And it's also helpful because the tablet allows you to have these geophysical layers and other ortho imagery and uh, LIDAR surfaces. So we have a, a very high resolution um, topographic surface for our property. Um, that's one of the critical things. Using a drone has been immensely helpful because this stuff is extremely rugged. If you're gonna die going up the side of a mountain, just fly a drone up it instead. And we can do a stereophotogrammetry and very detailed ortho imagery. And that actually allows us to do a lot of our line work um, using drone-based imagery. And then uh, we're also collecting uh, lithogeochemical samples. And this is vital because um, a lot of the um, issues that we found with uh, some of the pre-existing work, it's not the, the descriptions and the geology that's wrong. It's just the identification of the rock uh, volcanic rock was an error because you could have a gray andesite, a gray dacite, and a gray rhyolite that are all massive and aetheric, and they look the same. It's difficult to identify these things sometimes, particularly if you're looking at a weathered surface. Uh, it's difficult to identify and drill for. So we developed a database. Uh, we now have about uh, 5,000 lithogeochemical samples of volcanic rocks that has allowed us to uh, confidently and uh, quantitatively identify uh, the um, chemical classification of these volcanic rocks. And then that allows us to use the handheld XRF units, uh, not only in the field, but at the core shack, uh, in order to confidently identify the uh, volcanic rock types that we're looking at, because it is absolutely critical that you understand what type of volcanic rock you're looking at. And I'll explain that. Uh, more here in a little bit. So the Hazelton Group rock, uh, both the lower and upper Hazelton Group, are exposed along these antiform structures. Um, and it's not just a simple anticline. This stuff is dissected by thrust faults, back thrust faults, transform faults, and shear zones. I mean, this stuff is diced up. You have to think about what's happened over the past 200 million years. This thing went from being a submarine back arc basin to the basin being inverted during uh, terrain accretion and mountain building during the Cretaceous. We need to be able to back out that story and kind of undo 200 million years of deformation in order to understand uh, what we're looking at. And then the Hazelton group uh, has, uh, at least on our property, has thrust fault contacts with the uh, Underlying Stuhini group, uh, which Jeff Kaiba discusses in more detail in this lecture series. And we have uh, thrust fault contacts with the overlying Bowser Lake group as well. Um, I'd say our work has also confirmed the presence of district scale BMS mineralization. I'll note, I'm not saying it's economic mineralization, but we've been able to show that uh, there are numerous uh, BMS system along strike within the Hazelton group. So just like we see on that one, the Fuca Ridge example, we've got these hydrothermal centers along strike. And we also have uh, stacked BMS systems is the rule. We see this not only within the lower Hazelton group um, and the sites, but also within the upper Hazelton group, bimodal, uh, basalt, or uh, rhyolite as well. So that those 
quite a bit of um, mineralization throughout the entire stratigraphy and a long strike within the Hazelton group. Um, so, you know, that's one of the starting places as um, Jeff uh, Kaiba discusses in his uh, lecture in this series is we got to find the base of the Hazelton group. Uh, so we're looking at the Stuhini group, Hazelton group contact. Uh, we have a picture here on the left showing um, some of the, the turbidite sequences that we see in the uppermost Stuhini group. And then over here on the right hand is actually that contact that we see uh, between the Stuhini group turbidites on the left side of the image. And then on the right side of the image, uh, we actually see um, that we're getting into Bruce Glacier Felsic unit. You know, it's actually the upper Hazelton group. And along that contact, uh, we see there's a lot of drag folding, micro faulting, and one of the biggest indicators of proximity to a fault, um, in addition to deformation, is the presence of quartz carbonate uh, veining. It's something that's quite ubiquitous along these fault structures. And here's just some other examples uh, showing off on the left side. Here's a, a, a view from the helicopter. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to not only get your boots on the ground, but to get up in a helicopter and ask the pilot to fly you around and get the views that you need. And, you know, most people don't have the, the luxury of being able to do geology with a helicopter, but out here in the Golden Triangle, it's essential. So you may as well take advantage of it and um, do what you can. Take videos, take photographs. It's all important. Uh, and then we get onto the fault itself. You see in this middle image here, uh, quite large uh, area of uh, quartz carbonate, um, siderite in particular, uh, veining. And then right into that fault zone, this uh, image over here on the right side is an example of um, kind of Stuhini group metasediments. And that stuff's incredibly deformed. It has pencil cleavage. This stuff extremely sheared up, showing that you're getting right into that um, area of deformation here. And one of the things we see a lot is um, a lot of faulting is focused into the more carbonaceous sedimentary units. And a lot of times you'll see um, more of a, um, a, a, a deformation, of ductile deformation of the sedimentary units and more brittle deformation of uh, the volcanic units, just because volcanic rocks are rheologically more resistant than these uh, softer sedimentary rocks. So that was our base of the Hazelton group, or at least the Stuhini group that underlies the Hazelton. Um, so I'm gonna start going through some of our showings, our prospect here, starting from the bottom, going up to the top of our stratigraphy. So we're looking along the Eskate anticline trend right here. This is a, a sky tim image showing the conductivity. Uh, where these really bright pinks and reds are showing where our um, carbonaceous and graphitic uh, mudstones are. And a lot of our um, deposits that we have here, particularly what we talk about is TV, Jeff and Jeff North, are located along the flanks of these structures here. In this case, uh, Jeff, TV and Jeff North are located on the east limb of the Eskate Anticline. Uh, we have a lot of new work that we've done as well as building off the old rock chip sampling and soil sampling. Can I emphasize enough the value of reading old assessment reports and digitizing that information if it isn't in the database already? Because in addition to geophysics, we can use uh, geochemical work as well. And a lot of the um, prospects we have that have uh, successfully intercepted gold and silver mineralization were found using geochemical anomaly. So that's what a lot of these colored squares uh, and dots on here is our soil sampling and rock chip sampling. And I'll be focusing in on um, the Jeff and TV deposits. So Jeff is in the lower Hazelton group, Betty Creek formation and the sites. Um, and we have, uh, as part of our procedure, you know, we get out in the field and do our field work. So we're, we're mapping while we're out there collecting samples. But, you know, again, this stuff is a bog for the most part. 
So finding out prop can be difficult, but when you do, you really need to try to follow it up and sample it. Um, and that's how the, the old timers actually found uh, the Jeff deposit uh, to begin with back in 19, early 1990s was uh, doing geochemical sampling. And then uh, they did a limited drill program, which we subsequently came back to have followed up on. Um, and what we're seeing here um, with our detailed pore logging, important because we need to know where our stratigraphy is. Uh, and then we um, have our gold uh, and silver mineralization, or our gold and silver concentration, excuse me, and copper, zinc, lead, sulfur, arsenic, antimony, mercury, cadmium, uh, thallium. These are called pathfinder elements. These are elements that are typically associated with, uh, if not sulfide mineralization, then um, you've got gold and silver mineralization as well. You need to think about the mineralogy and what other elements could be associated with. Uh, in this case, silver a lot of times goes with antimony and arsenic goes with gold, as I'll explain. Uh, and you know, we drill our hole, uh, we do our detailed logging, we use the handheld XRF to give us a good, I would say semi-quantitative understanding of what we're intercepting. Uh, and then that allows us to make uh, further evaluations about what we want to do with drilling. And then we come back, you know, it's iterative. We have to come back once we get our assays and kind of plot these assays up next to our graphic log. And we're able to see that a lot of the best uh, gold grade, and this is something we see um, in several drill holes, occurs with uh, these um, contacts between mudstone and dacite within the Betty Creek formation. So it's this Johnny uh, Mountain dacite and uh, the uh, Bruce Jack Lake uh, dacite are really the areas where we start to see the best gold and silver mineralization. It's not just in the andesite, it's the dacitic intervals seem to be uh, where we're getting our, our best uh, gold and silver grades. And uh, we'll look at just some cross sections that uh, we made here. Uh, these are downhole assays right here. Uh, what we found at Jeff is we've got a stacked VMS system uh, where we have our stock work zone, our lower stock work zone uh, is dominantly hosted within andesites. And then uh, we get to our day site and then the mudstone that the day site can be mixed with because you imagine this um, magma is erupting into unconsolidated sediment forming what we call a pepperidic texture and that these are absolutely critical um, to identify these pepperidic textures because that tells you you're in a volcanically active environment that's on the seafloor and it, it turns out that that's where a lot of the um, kind of semi-massive sulfide is that we found that Jeff is associated with the pepperites because as I noted earlier, we have a sub seafloor replacement environment where if you've got kind of a really busted up rock, like a pepperite tends to be, if you erupt a thousand degrees Celsius rock magma into cold ocean water, it's going to fracture and shatter, quench, and forming what we call hyaloplastite. And it's that kind of really broken up rock that's a favorable host um, and conduit for these hydrothermal fluids to form uh, a BMS uh, deposit. And then we have this unaltered package of mudstone. And then overlying the unaltered rock package is another interval of uh, andesites hosting stock work and um, more dacite, actually. So we, we're kind of getting this uh, stacking in the system. And I should note, there's not a fault repeating this stratigraphy. This is actually two distinct mineralizing events that we've uh, been able to see here. And I'll be talking about TV, which lies about a kilometer and a half to the south of Jeff. Um, TV is stratigraphically, uh, the base of TV is stratigraphically equivalent to this upper stock work zone here at Jeff. And we also look at hydrothermal alteration. So this is something that you get if you do your uh, full 54 element um, uh, assay suite. You don't just go for your commodity metals like uh, some people do, but if you get the, the full um, assay suite, 
and you can calculate your alteration indices and then actually be able to model these blue blobs here are our zones of intense hydrothermal alteration. That's telling us that we are in the right environment. We're definitely in a hydrothermal system. And you can see these orange blobs, that's our zones of um, gold and silver mineralization associated with sulfide. And what you can see is that these uh, zones of intense alteration typically underlie the uh, gold and silver mineralization. That's because these zones of alteration are coming up through the seafloor and then erupting onto the seafloor and forming the gold and silver uh, massive sulfide or semi-massive sulfide, but there's no hydrothermal alteration above these because you can't alter a rock that doesn't exist yet. And then once these um, systems are buried by either um, additional sediment or more volcanic rocks, um, you know, the hydrothermal system's not going through these rocks at this point. And then by the time you have this uh, system get reestablished, it's not necessarily going through the exact same conduits that uh, the fluids went through before. And we did something called asymmetric alteration, where the alteration is focused below the VMS mineralization. And that is absolutely critical towards uh, determining where your stratigraphic up is with respect to the hydrothermal system is looking at asymmetric alteration. And, you know, we come back after we have all of our lithogeochemical data, which I'm showing a plot here. You can use titanium zirconium concentrations. This is using um, laboratory analysis here, but you can do the same thing with the handheld XRF. And that allows us to quantitatively define um, what type of volcanic rock we're dealing with, where rhyolites are typically high in zirconium or low in titanium, dacites, andesites, and then basalts have the highest titanium and the lowest zirconium. So it's kind of a, a progression of different titanium zirconium concentrations, but you can use that to quantitatively identify your rocks and then come up with a uh, um, kind of these cross sections here, which are showing where or, or what types of rocks we have here. And I'll, I'll note that these kind of uh, purple uh, areas here, that's our um, andesites, and then this real dark purple is our dacite. That's sort of where the highest grades are. Um, and these blue uh, uh, blobs on here, that's conglomerate and volcanic clastic debris flow breccia. Those are absolutely critical for identifying proximity to your volcanic structure. You need topography in order to form these conglomerates that have the energy to transport these conglomerates. And when you see conglomerates in close association or debris flow breccia in close association with a volcanic rock, you know you're very close to a symbolcanic fault structure. And sure enough, that's what we're, we're finding is we've got alteration telling us that, the mineralization telling us that, as well as the presence of these conglomerates and the reflow. So, you know, you really have to think about the entire data set as an integrated kind of whole in order to understand this. So we started drilling to the north of uh, Jeff and what we uh, see here, uh, unfortunately, it wasn't very high grade, but we have a very broad zone going 800 meters to the north of Jeff of um, gold and silver mineralization, as well as some elevated uh, uh, capopyrite, um, spalerite, so copper and zinc mineralization as well. And what's, what this is showing is that these are still favorable horizons that continue along strike. Uh, we're probably dealing with a situation where the actual volcanic structure and the volcanic center was located at Jeff over here on the right side of the image, but you're still getting some kind of like hydrothermal bleeding out along these horizons over 800 meters to the north, showing that the, the system's actually quite large. But just because you have a a sulfide bearing system does not mean that you've got gold and silver. And that's one of the big um, issues with exploration at here. It's pretty easy to find a VMS deposit for sulfide, 
but it's very difficult to actually um, get the gold and silver with that. Geophysics is not going to tell you where gold and silver is. And unfortunately, the handheld XRF doesn't tell you where, where gold is. It just can't analyze that. So that's why we focus on um, these Pathfinder elements. And that's one of the reasons uh, we uh, have um, funds for uh, master's students, which I advise and co-advise, is to look at these uh, samples through uh, not only an optical microscope, but an electron microscope, because it's important to understand what the uh, mineral hosts are for these metals in order uh, to interpret your XRF data that you're getting, or even the assay data. It's actually pretty important to know uh, what sorts of mineral hosts we have. And you know, at Jeff, the dominant host for gold is electrum, and it invariably is uh, filling fractures within other sulfides or sulfur salt minerals, but the dominant um, takeaway is that it's a fracture filling mineral, this electrum, that's a gold, natural gold, silver alloy. And then our dominant uh, silver host is a tetrahedrite or fibrogite. Uh, we've also found native silver in some spots as well. And then of course, uh, electrum is a host as well. And then we do have trace amounts of uh, galena, cacopyrite, and spalarite as well. And, and you know, a really interesting um, thing that we see at Jeff is this sort of um, very silicified and carbonate altered rock here. This is an andesite, uh, but we've got um, pyrargyrite, this kind of uh, wine red colored mineral here with visible electrum. And uh, we actually uh, showed these samples uh, to um, the people over at Bruce Jack, and they're like, well, this looks a lot like what we're mining, but we're calling it epithermal. Well, there's really no difference between epithermal and the BMS system other than epithermal, either shallow water or above sea level, and BMS is so far below sea level, you don't get boiling. That's what creates epithermal mineralization is boiling, dumping out gold. Whereas you have such a, a, a high hydrostatic pressure uh, below sea level, you aren't gonna boil hydrothermal fluid, so we have a temperature-driven precipitation mechanism instead. But there's probably a continuum between these porphyry and epithermal environment towards the VMS further uh, to the west, which uh, we're inferring is gonna be deeper within um, uh, extensional rift basin. And just some other examples of the uh, sorts of uh, mineralogy that we uh, get here at Jeff. Um, we have a lot of pyrotite, but again, the precious uh, metal mineralization typically post dates uh, most of the base metal sulfide mineralization we see at Jeff. And as you'll see, uh, the same is true for TV, the same is true for Sybil Lulu. It's pretty much a property wide. Uh, thing that we see that the paragenetic sequence and the order that these minerals formed in is pretty similar uh, across these different deposits. So moving at a kilometer and a half to the south, to the TV deposit um, or prospect, uh, we've again drilled into um, a syn volcanic structure. We've got a lot of andesite, uh, a little bit less dacite in this case, a lot more sedimentary rocks, and um, this kind of real bright green um, sill right here on this uh, image to the left, that's a, a, a diorite sill that uh, may be related to the uh, intrusion of John's Peak. Uh, but what we see here is uh, that the mineralization is cut by this sill. So that's their cross-cutting relationships. Your fundamental geological principles are absolutely critical towards understanding these systems and we can tell that uh, this diorite was in place after mineralization. Um, so, you know, we have the andesite. So we're no, we're still within this kind of orc related environment to this incipient rifting of the orc. And that's uh, where we're uh, forming both TB and Jeff. As I mentioned earlier, TB stratigraphically uh, somewhat above the Jeff um, showing and what we see at TV is much more robust gold and silver grades over a lot longer uh, lengths. Uh, again, uh, this image over here on the right is showing our uh, blue 
uh, zones of hydrothermal alteration overlain by our uh, massive sulfide mineralization. Again, another gap where there's no alteration or mineralization, and then we get into another stacked um, system where we've got another stock work zone that once again is overlain by a very large uh, zone of massive to semi-massive sulfide mineralization here, uh, which uh, we followed up with uh, quite a bit of drilling. You know, one of the things about BMS is we're not talking about a large disseminated mineralization. These are small pods that, you know, could be one to 500 meters across and tens of meters thick. You need to hit these things because you can miss one. If you're drilling five meters away from the edge of it, you wouldn't know unless you looked at the hydrothermal alteration. But, you know, these things can be missed. It is like finding a needle in a haystack out here in the Golden Triangle. So you do kind of have to do some more closely spaced drilling once you hit onto um, good uh, gold and silver numbers. So looking at the sorts of mineralization we see here at TV, uh, we have um, an extensive zone of massive sulfide mineralization um, that's associated with intense silicification. Silicification is one of the key types of alteration that tells you you are in the core of this hydrothermal upflow zone. And then you work your way out and you get into more of like an illite and then chloride alteration. So there is a zonation to the alteration and that can help you vector towards um, where you want to be. But silicification is a great thing to find for BMS. And then this massive sulfide zone is underlain by an extensive stock work zone. The stock work is basically where all the, uh, the sulfides filling these fractures, these fluids are coming up, fractures in the rock. Um, it's actually uh, hydrothermal fracturing of the rock and uh, start to precipitate these sulfides within about 200 meters or so of the seafloor position. And then the massive sulfide itself forms on the, the seafloor in the immediate um, sub-seafloor environment. So one of the things that uh, we have our master's students doing again is looking through the electron microscope to um, you know, really identify the sorts of mineralogy that we have in the system, the hydrothermal alteration that we see in the system. Um, so one thing I'll note um, with our minerals here, we've got um, the alteration minerals, we've got a lot of barite, a lot of celsian, which is a barium bearing hydro, uh, uh, feldspar, and uh, a lot of carbonate and we're not seeing a ton of the uh, illite and really intense chloride alteration. And what this tells us is we're dealing with a low temperature system. We're thinking about 150 degrees Celsius. This is also borne out by the absence of abundant chalcopyrite, which would tell us we're in a much higher temperature uh, system. And we really don't have much in the way of uh, base metals here either. It's really just a gold, silver, um, pyrite system here and you know all of these things combined with the alteration mineralogy are telling us that we're in a, a low temperature hydrothermal system and something that's very important and i think this is um, work done by uh, one of my students colt eck at colorado school of mines is um, he found arsenic zoning within the pyrite um, and you know, some of this pyrite's been recrystallized because we are in an uh, environment where there's been deformation. Pyrite is uh, easily deformed and recrystallized. And what he has found um, is that, you know, these arsenic growth zones are gold bearing. There's gold within the arsenian pyrite structure. And what he's also found is the more recrystallization there is, uh, the more you're finding electrum within these fractures. So what we're thinking is, and may be that the primary gold mineralization was arsenium pyrite, but it's this subsequent, um, much later deformation event that remobilized, diffused that gold out of the pyrite crystal structure and allowed it to uh, form electrum in the fractures. And this actually has a metallurgical implication because it's a lot easier to, you know, crush a rock and do flotation on you know, electrum filling fractures than to have a, a more refractory mineralogy where you actually have to roast 
kind of oxidized this pyrite at 800 degrees Celsius, it's much more energy intensive to get gold out of arsenium pyrite. So deformation is actually helping us metallurgically uh, with uh, the mineralogy at this um, uh, deposit. So I'm gonna move uh, about four kilometers to the south of TB, uh, where we're looking at uh, the Cumberland uh, prospect. And this is something there's actually old addicts put in there around 1901. These guys, you know, took a boat up the Unit River, which is incredibly rough. You know, they tried to start a mining operation here that failed because all their equipment got destroyed going up the river. Uh, however, they were onto something over there. They didn't know it was VMS, um, but they found at what appears to be a, a significant zone of mineralization. So fast forward 87 years, and uh, you've got um, guys looking from 1987 to 1996 at the Cumberland showing again. They did um, their first soil sampling program, uh, which is what the data is here on this map to the, uh, the right. Uh, where we, we have our um, soils uh, anomalies of 5 ppm silver, which is pretty high for a soil. That means the silver is being mobilized out of the bedrock and brought up into the soil horizon. So that helps us uh, determine what the geochemical characteristics are below the soil horizon. And, um, you know, these guys started drilling in this area, very limited drill program, but they did find um, a considerable amount of uh, base metals, uh, lead and um, zinc in particular, as well as some uh, fairly respectable uh, gold values. Uh, you know, these guys in 87 got up to 10 grams per ton over a couple of meters in there, as well as a lot more uh, lower grade uh, mineralization. And, um, you know, I was able to look at some of these samples that we have sitting at our quarry camp and it's a VMS deposit. Um, you know, the older guys uh, just called it a vein-hosted system, which could be open to a lot of interpretations. We were able to really confirm that we've got a, a VMS system, um, but that was just based off of a handful of, of drill core samples. We don't have entire drill holes to look at. So we came back in 2023, um, just this past summer, and uh, did a limited drill program to kind of follow up on some of those older drill holes, um, trying to twin them as well as explore uh, nearby some of the zones that they have not drilled. And we were able to identify a, actually a, a much higher grade zone at Cumberland and clearly define a C4 position. And this is where that asymmetric alteration really came in handy. We were able to after drilling three drill holes in this thing, to find the plane, because we did a, a three-point problem like you're learning structural geology, actually able to define that plane, plan a drill hole that went straight down that plane, and we had CBL 2331 that had our longest intercept ever at Cumberland um, of gold and silver mineralization. And what we found is that we're dealing with a system where off to the west, we've got our intensely altered um, andesite, a pillow andesite. And then right at the C4 position, we have massive sulfide mixed with barite breccia. And barite is a, a hydrothermal um, mineral that forms from barium being leached out of the rock package below and into these hydrothermal fluids, reacting with sulfate that's in the cold seawater and forming barite right at the C4 position. And then immediately overlying this is a, a pillow basalt uh, that's highly magnetic, there's a visible magnetite in it, and it's uh, really not hydrothermally altered, at least it doesn't have the, the high alteration indices that stuff uh, below does. And I was able to tell us that we're dealing with a system that's somewhat overturned. You know, we're not dealing, it's a layer cake, but it's been flipped over a little bit. And that's important to realize that you can be dealing with overturned systems. Um, it's also important uh, to take magnetic susceptibility measurements. Uh, that's what we've got over here. Uh, on the lower left, uh, we have our uh, logging that's uh, 
quantified using our XRF, so we confidently know what type of rock we're in. And then we see our assays in the middle, and then our alteration index and the chloride carbonate pyrite index showing us that the alteration index is highest right at this C4 position that's defined by the mass of sulfide and the barite. And then overlying that in the basalt, we get more of our chloride, epidote, and carbonate alteration because uh, you can still have a little bit of kind of waning hydrothermal fluid going through these uh, pillow basalts that have, you know, overrun the mineralization. But one of the biggest things about this horizon is since we measured magnetic susceptibility, we can see that there is a very strong contrast in magnetism um, right at that uh, contact. So we can define that contact based on magnetism, use our geophysical survey here um, and uh, modeling done by our geophysicist Tom Weiss and Riaz Mirza, who's um, generously supporting uh, this uh, series of lectures. And that's actually allowing us to start to define uh, this horizon as it goes um, undercover. We can't see it, but it has a strong magnetic signature. We know what it represents. It's that seafloor. And fortunately, uh, that um, horizon that we were able to project based on our drilling uh, goes right underneath where the best silver anomalies are from the 1987 soil survey. So you really need to be able to use all the data at your disposal and make an interpretation that is consistent when, when the data and interpretations all point towards the same conclusion as a good thing. When they're diverging, something is wrong. And it's it's usually the geologist's brain that is wrong. It's not the rocks that are wrong, it's the geologist putting their ego in front of actual observation. So just get rid of the ego and look at the rocks. The rocks are, are what they are. You have to listen to them. Uh, so now we're gonna move into the upper Hazleton group uh, here uh, along uh, the Sib and Lulu trend. So this is uh, on the west limb of the SK anticline just um, southwest along strike from the world-class SK Creek mine. And um, what we see here is, um, while not only do we have um, mineralization in both the lower and upper Hazleton group, but it's occurring along strike. So this is one of the only areas on the property where we see the full stratigraphic package of the Hazleton group. And, um, you know, since I've already talked a lot about the lower Hazleton group, I'll ignore that at SID, but we do have it. It's typically hosted by um, recrystallized, disseminated euhedral pyrite. Um, within andesites in particular where there's mudstone, so a lot like TV and Jeff. Uh, but as we're moving up through the Spatsizi formation, which I mentioned earlier, the upper part of the Spatsizi formation has our um, first hints of rhyolite. That's where we're really starting to get this mature back arc rift volcanism. And sure enough, that is where uh, we start to see our uh, mineralization is associated where these rhyolites are intruded into unconsolidated sediment, forming a pepperitic texture. And we have, you know, our best intercept up there, 61.9 grams of gold over um, a meter and a half. Uh, so that, that's, you know, pretty respectable uh, grade up there. And that's uh, immediately south of Skeena's Tamakai zone, which appears to be an extension of this type of mineralization up here, but this is within the Spatsizi formation. Uh, going south, Hululu, we have drill hole 02113. So this is from something drilled in 2002, but it's important to go back and look at the old drill core because the interpretations, and especially in this case, the logs just weren't correct because they weren't, they didn't have the advantage of using an XRF to be able to quantitatively identify the rock types. So what we're seeing here is that, again, uh, if you look at this column here at the gold, silver arsenic, we've got these huge peaks in silver and gold associated with mudstone within the rhyolite. This is a stratigraphic equivalent of the lower mudstone um, at uh, Skeena Resources ground. And then there's some other, at least in this drill hole, more modest bumps 
and uh, gold grade associated with our rhyolites and the Spatsizi formation. And then we start going down into the Betty Creek formation where we have our day sites. Just like TV and Jeff, where we're having spikes in gold and silver concentrations associated with the um, eruption of these more felsic magmas within a um, dominantly and acidic um, uh, volcanic package. And again, we do our lithogeochemical sampling to um, quantitatively identify the rocks. And you know what we're seeing here is. Um, an example from that lower mudstone uh, horizon where we've got um, semi-massive to in some cases massive sulfo salt minerals uh, that are grading up to 20 grams per ton gold and several thousand grams per ton silver. Um, and a lot of that's associated with barite. Again, just like at Cumberland, we've got uh, the presence of barite, which is a good indicator that you're on the seafloor horizon along with that mudstone as well. And, and as I said earlier, we're dealing a, with a lot of the same alteration minerals. We have very um, high barium anomalies and a lot of barium uh, minerals associated with the hydrothermal alteration, as well as our fracture filling um, silver, sulfur salts and electrum. So, you know, even though we're dealing with a package of rock that could be 15 to 20 million years younger than what we saw at TV and Jeff, we're looking at the same sorts of hydrothermal alteration and the same sorts of occurrences of uh, gold and silver, even though we're dealing with a, a rock package that's significantly younger. And we do think that th these are all discrete mineralizing events, and it's highly likely that what we see in the lower Hazelton group is much older than the upper Hazelton group and that they are actual distinct um, mineralizing events from each other. So uh, lastly, we're going to talk about the Scarlet Tarn uh, trend over here. This is to the east of the SK anticline where we have another, I call it antiform. Um, it's an anticline, but it's really diced up by uh, back thrusting and shear zones, which complicate um, matters considerably as far as mapping goes. Uh, but we are in upper Hazelton group rocks over here. Um, in particular, one of our new findings was this area had formerly been mapped as uh, predominantly the um, Bruce Glacier Felsic unit. While we do see a decent bit of that, we have a considerable exposure of SK rhyolite on the surface. Out uh, here, um, which has never been drilled before. So, you know, one of our the first things we did, uh, this is a major focus of mapping efforts in 2022, as well as uh, this past year, we got out there, did our, our rock chip sampling, and combined these results with um, some previous work that had been done out here. We weren't the first ones to come out here. Uh, people have been sampling this area for the past 30 years. Um, and there was a little bit of limited drilling over here on the, the eastern uh, part of this map here. Uh, but what we're able to find, particularly at Tarn Lake, was a very broad zone of disseminated uh, gold uh, mineralization with sulfides, as well as some areas that get into semi-massive um, sulfide as well. But it's a, a big zone of um, replacement style mineralization. So here's a, a, a photo of the outcrops at uh, Tarn Lake, you know, this thing we're seeing is extending about 300 meters along strike now. And uh, as you're going um, east to west, kind of perpendicular to the stratigraphy, we can trace this thing for about 250 meters. It also goes underneath the glacier, as we've determined from drilling. And this is the sort of stuff you can see out there on the surface is a massive sulfide replacement of conglomerate. So again, our conglomerate telling us we're near um, some topography in the old days. You know, when I say old days, I'm talking 175 million years ago, old days. Um, but we also have visible sulfo salts that you can see with the hand lens. And then we can back this up uh, by shooting an XRF at it, even though the point that the XRF is analyzing is about eight millimeters across you can get a good idea if you've got a lot of antimony and silver in there, you can back up your uh, field IDs with uh, some semi-quantitative 
um, information. And what we see at Tarn Lake is again a very broad zone of intense hydrothermal alteration. It's probably the most hydrothermally altered rock we've seen on the property at Tarn Lake. Um, and one thing I really want to point out is the zone of hydrothermal alteration corresponds broadly with a zone of lower magnetic susceptibility. That's one of the key um, things about hydrothermal alteration. It destroys magnetite, it destroys magnetism. And that's one of the ways you can use geophysics to identify these upflow zones in these hydrothermal systems is look for magnetic lows surrounded by magnetic highs. And that's what we were able to do. Um, and now we found a very broad zone here of, when I say low grade, I'm talking like 0.1 to 0.5 gram per ton um, gold and gold equivalent um, mineralization with some uh, zones here where we have these horizons that are um, more well replaced. There's a getting up to semi-massive replacement style sulfide within these zones, but unfortunately we have not been able to identify a, a C4 horizon at this point that may be further off to the west, that it would be kind of off to the, the right hand side of this lower um, right hand figure here. And then we have our glacier, uh, Bruce Glacier, kind of uh, intervening between our scarlet mob showing and this big trend of um, rock chip samples over here that's uh, gold and silver bearing with some quite high grades. You know, we found a sample is 56.9 grams per ton gold. Um, the thing about rock chip samples is we're kind of high grading this stuff. When you're drilling, we're taking like a meter long sample of rhyolite mixed with sulfide and it's always going to be lower grade than a rock chip sample because the rock chip are basically banging the sulfide off the rock, it's going to be a higher grade. You're diluting um, your grade when you're mixing in the rhyolite with it, but that's actually important because you know drilling gives you a more representative um, idea of what the grades are here. But what we have found is at Tarn Lake, um, very broad zone. You know we're talking over 400 meters or so. Um, you know, east to west, and then about 300 meters north to south of a broad zone of this um, disseminated uh, gold uh, mineralization here. So that's an area we're certainly going to be returning to. And that Scarlet Knob, we did uh, some limited drilling uh, right near one of our um, rock chip samples that came from a stock work vein. A lot of these veins of sulfide are occurring proximal to andesite dikes cutting the stratigraphy. Andesite dikes out here are pretty much perpendicular to the stratigraphy, which is indicating we're dealing with syn volcanic structures here, where these fluids are traveling at the same conduit, andesite comes up through it, forms these dikes, and then you can see more fluid coming along and replacing some of the andesite and you know, really clinging tightly to uh, these dikes. And, uh, we, you know, identified our C4 horizon here based again off of um, in drill hole based off of our asymmetric alteration. We're able to find, you know, some modestly elevated gold and silver numbers here. There's a decent bit of sulfide, but there just wasn't a, as much gold and silver as we wanted. But that's okay. We found that we definitely have a C4 horizon that, um, as we come out from under the glacier. A lot of this is covered by lateral moraine, uh, so you can't see below that uh, unless you use your magnet, uh, magnetic survey here, which we see uh, between Scarlet Knob and Tarn Lake, this huge magnetic low here. That's our, what we're interpreting as our hydrothermal system. And we also have a couple of other um, showings we drilled in 2022, Scarlet Ridge and Scarlet Valley, that are also associated with uh, much less pronounced magnetic lows uh, surrounded by cutting these magnetic highs. Um, and as we're out walking on the surface, kind of tracing out where the C4 horizon could go uh, this season, we found a, a pretty large zone of um, semi-massive replacement style mineralization on the surface uh, that uh, you can see right here. Uh, here we have one of our geos and then uh, Nate Corcoran, who's uh, 
uh, the, the regional geologist uh, for the BCGS came out on our property and we uh, shared them around uh, out there. And um, we actually found this zone while we were walking with him. Um, you know, it might be a little difficult to see in this upper right hand image, but there is a zone of semi massive sulfide. Uh, Nate is a little harder to see, but there he is, very small right there. But that gives you a good idea of the, the scale of this zone of uh, semi-massive replacement sulfide where we just released um, some assays from this sample where we got, a, I think it was like 22 grams per ton gold and several hundred grams per ton silver out of this sample, which you know is more representative because this is a zone of semi-massive to massive sulfide here that we'll be returning to uh, next year. <clears throat> Um, and then briefly, we're going uh, just to the north, about uh, 500 meters or so north of Scarlet and Knob. We're still uh, within, I'd say, the kind of the contact between the SK Rhyolite and the Bruce Glacier Fussick Unit, which we also see in drill core at Scarlet Knob. Um, and this is a zone that, you know, still has a good bit of um, sulfide mineralization on the surface and decent rock chip samples. Uh, unfortunately, what we found with drilling though is that the hydrothermal alteration is much less intense than it is further to the south, um, despite the uh, sulfide mineralization. But we, we, what we found was, as well as there not being as intense of hydrothermal alteration, that the gold and silver grades weren't as good up in this area as well. In summary, I'd like to uh, note that BMS mineralization on our property is hosted by volcanic rocks in both upper and lower Hazleton group. Um, so what we're showing here is that not only do we have stacked VMS mineralization, uh, but we do have uh, VMS systems occurring along stripes. So this is consistent with uh, what we see in other VMS districts around the world. So what we need to do and uh, what other explorers should be doing in the Golden Triangle is looking uh, for uh, mineralization occurring along these favorable horizons, you have to identify those horizons using this integrated approach uh, where you're able to um, look at the, the volcanic stratigraphy and the sedimentary stratigraphy, understand your hydrothermal alteration, because um, hydrothermal alteration not only will tell you something about the seafloor position as I uh, discussed with asymmetric alteration, but your zones of magnetite destruction will actually show you where hydrothermal systems are using your magnetic geophysical data. And being able to understand something about the mineralogy of these systems is uh, very important because that helps you interpret your assay results, your handheld XRF results, your, your field results. You need to be able to look through a hand lens and identify minerals. You can make a lot of decisions using what you learn in school. Just take it out of the book and actually use it. It's important stuff. And um, another thing to note, a big takeaway on this property is that deformation and pirate recrystallization may play a role in making uh, these deposits more metal metallurgically favorable. So you know you really have to be able to take everything you've ever learned about geology and put it all together. And uh, then you, you may have a better chance at finding these deposits, but again, it's a very difficult area to work in. We have a limited four to five month window in which to do this exploration before the weather uh, shuts things down. So you have to be able to prioritize, you know, what sort of field information can I get and use right now versus the assays. They're always going to take too long for the investors, too long for us geologists. You have to be able to work over the winter months and refine your models and understanding this area to be able to hit the ground running in the next season. But you know, investors, us as geologists, need to be patient when working in this area because it's one thing to look at a map like this. It's another thing to walk up the side of a mountain or be confronted with a cliff or a grizzly bear or a stream that looked like you could jump across but if you slipped in, you just get dashed on the rocks. Um, this is a rough area up here, so, you know, we have to be patient. And I'd like to uh, thank GTU for hosting these talks. Um, if you uh, like this uh, lecture, please uh, hit the like button and subscribe because there are several other good 
uh, talks that I alluded to um, on the uh, GTU YouTube channel. So thank you very much.